Okay, so welcome everyone for the Geometry Keynote uh, talk. And I would like to first of all say how you can see that he's very young. He's the youngest of all teenagers that we have here in the Bayern. And why he was invited to give a Kenyan talk is that uh, well, last year I went to a um, conference in English for some uh, geometry in the same world. And it was Victor Gidenin speaking, so plenary. And in this talk, he said, Yes, this last quarter of an hour is going to be Sylvia taking over because she will explain it much better. So wonderful and so great, and I thought she would be uh, the best geometry given for us. Yeah, let me just say that I didn't know this, so I was in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> and Victor started to say, well, maybe you could continue to give the talk. And I was like... <laughs> and she just completely surprised us, recording about me too. more than was about 2,250 people in the audience, <laughs> and so that I understand that. It was so great that thank you very much for coming. No, thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> so, um, so today I will talk a little bit about this problem of, as you can see, classifying Hamiltonian actions on symplectic manifolds. And actually I realized, so I'm coming from another conference, which was in uh, Zurich, in honor of Dietmar, Dietmar Salomon. And I just realized that uh, Yael Karchon gave a talk, which is very similar for the first half of the talk that I'm giving. So, uh, and uh, Jusa McDuff was also there, but I hope she's the only overlapping person uh, uh, in the audience. But in any case, so let me give you an outline of the talk. So first of all, I will explain what a symplectic manifold with symmetries is. So I will define these four objects that you see, um, that you see here. And then I will uh, be talking about how hard it is to classify the symplectic manifolds, of course, up to suitable transformations that I will define with the special symmetries, because somehow the presence of this G, this G is a Lie group, and I will tell you what it means for a symplectic manifold to have the symmetry. So maybe uh, the problem of classifying all the symplectic manifolds with the symmetries is a little too hard. So instead of taking this direction, what I will explain is that there is another direction that, the, that we might take, and more pre precisely, this is the direction in which we would like to classify some of their equivariant topological invariants. So for example, their equivariant cohomology ring and equivariant churn classes, and maybe in the future, equivariant K-theory ring. Let's see. So in order to face the second question, I will introduce um, a family of objects which is relatively easy to study and to visualize. And these objects are just graph, label graphs, which will keep information about the action. And the quite surprising and remarkable thing is that in some very nice example, these graphs actually tell us everything about the equivariant cohomology ring and churn classes. So the problem of classifying these topological invariants reduces to the problem of classifying these graphs. Okay? So I will give you many, hopefully, examples. So you will see many pictures in my talk because I'm trying to convince you that actually these graphs can really tell you a lot about, a lot of information about, about the manifold itself. And then I will end up with some open questions, okay? Which I am working on, but maybe some of you might be interested to work on. Okay, so let me first tell you what a symplectic manifold is. So let's consider <coughs> R2n with standard coordinates, x1, xn, y1, yn, and these two form omega zero. So, um, well, we know immediately that this form is closed, so the differential of omega zero is equal to zero, and is non-degenerate in the sense that for every point p in R2n, omega zero induces an isomorphism between the tangent space at p and the dual of the tangent space, where I pair the vector v, I send the vector v to the one form given by omega zero tested on v. It's very easy, actually, given this form, to, to realize that this is the case. And this seems to be a very <coughs> easy example, but it's actually the example that one should keep in mind, and we will see why. So first of all, a symplectic manifold is just a pair 
where m is a manifold endowed with a closed and non-degenerate two-form omega, just like in the first slide. And the group, well, so we want to identify two symplectic manifolds whenever there exists a symplectomorphism between them, which is nothing else but the diffeomorphism between m0 m and m1, which preserves the symplectic forms, me meaning that the pullback of omega1 is equal to omega0. Now, um, note that m is necessarily even-dimensional, just like in the previous example, and that is due to the non-degeneracy of the symplectic form. And the second fact is not really something that you can note, but something that should be proved, and is the Darboux theorem, which says that locally symplectic manifolds are indistinguishable, meaning that, name, meaning that they all look like the first example that you saw in the slide. So that means that symplectic geometry differs very much from, for example, Riemannian geometry, because I cannot have local invariants. I have to study global invariants. And these global invariants become, um, well, for example, what we are going to see, the topological invariants, they become much easier to study whenever I have a symmetry. So what do, what do I mean by a symmetry? So what do we mean by symplectic manifolds with symmetries? Well, let's look at this example. In this example, I have a Lie group, which is just S1. And now, <coughs> this is the sphere, two-dimensional sphere, which E is a symplectic manifold. And now, I can see, I can realize each element of S1 as a transformation of the sphere, where this theta goes to the rotation with angle theta along this axis. And it's pretty easy to see two things. So the first one is that I am preserving, so actually this is a symplectomorphism, so this transformation rho theta is a symplectomorphism, so it's preserving the symplectic form for each theta. And this is a homomorphism of groups, where the two groups are S1 and the symplectomorphisms of my sphere S2. So now we can generalize this definition saying that a symplectic manifold with symmetry is, well, the first ingredient is a symplectic manifold. The second one is a Lie group. And the third one is a non-trivial group homomorphism from G, my Lie group, which in my case, previous case was S1, and the symplectomorphism group of my manifold. And we would also like this homomorphism to, be, to have basically no kernel. So we would like this action to be effective, namely, each element of the group should give me a non-trivial transformation on my space, because otherwise it's not really D, it's not really a G symmetry, right? It's a smaller symmetry. So these, these are what they're called the effective actions. So I will always assume that my action is effective, meaning each element is giving, me, is giving rise to a non-trivial symplectomorphism. So, <clears throat> and this triple, I will refer to this triple as GX on M omega via symplectomorphisms. Now, for simplicity, I will assume that M is compact and connected, and that my Lie group is just a real torus, so S1 cross S1 cross S1 M times. Actually, I will, uh, the dimension of this torus acting is actually important, and whenever I, need, I will need, I will specify uh, which torus is acting on my symplectic manifold. Okay. So let's look at this other picture. This other picture is somehow an infinitesimal version of the picture that you saw before. What do I mean by an infinitesimal version? Well, this vector xi is a xi which lives in the tangent space at the identity of S1, so in the Lie algebra of S1. And this is a vector field on the sphere. And I mean, intuitively, this vector field is tangent to the orbits of my point, which are just you see this, these parallels here. So more precisely, how do I get this vector field? Well, I take an element of the Lie algebra of S1, and I take a curve in the Lie algebra. So I take T psi. I exponentiate this curve, thus giving me a curve on S1. And so I have this one parameter group of transformation on S1. So in this case, I mean, I'm just recovering the whole S1. And now I map with my homomorphism, so I will have basically a one parameter group of transformations on my sphere. And if I start from a point P, this will just be the orbit to P of this one parameter group of transformations. So in other words, this object here is a curve on the sphere, 
And if I differentiate this curve at time t equal to zero, I get precisely this vector psi sharp at p. Now, let's see what are the properties of this psi sharp. Well, since I am acting via symplectomorphisms, I can prove, basically, to you that um, the contraction of omega with psi sharp, so this is a one form, which I get by contracting, so evaluating omega on psi sharp. And it's pretty easy to see that this one form is closed. Why is that? Well, first of all, since, since uh, um, I am acting via symplectomorphisms, I am preserving my symplectic form. That means that the lead derivative with respect to psi sharp is equal to zero. But now, by Cartan magic formula, this is d composed with the contraction plus the contraction composed with d. But since omega is symplectic, this term is already zero, and so I get that this one form is closed. Okay. So now, I'm, what we are interested in uh, is actually a special case of, of these transformations, because instead of requiring, well, instead of having this form to be closed, we, what we would really like is that this form is exact, okay? So let me give you this definition. So a symplectic T action on a symplectic manifold is said to be Hamiltonian if there exists a map which is called the moment map of the action, which goes from the manifold to the <coughs> dual of the Lie algebra of the torus, so it's just going to be Rm, satisfying the following properties. So this mu has to be T invariant. And for every Xi in the Lie algebra, so these has to be thought as the Xi component of the moment map, which I get by, oops, which I get by the following formula. So, so this is a function that I get by evaluating my moment map at p. That means that I have an element of the dual of the Lie algebra. And I evaluate this on xi. So this is the pairing between the dual of the Lie algebra and the Lie algebra. And the condition that I want is that the contraction with psi sharp of omega is the differential of this component of the moment map. OK? So now I will give you um, a set of examples. So first of all, this quadruple is called a Hamiltonian T-space. And so the first example is the example that I showed you before. So we have S2 with symplectic form, oops, OK, with symplectic form d theta wedge dh with an S1 action. And it's easy to see that the Hamiltonian is precisely the height function. Why is that? Well. So first of all, it's quite easy to see that the vector psi sharp is just the vector d in d theta, so the vector tangent to these lines. And if I contract with d in d theta, the form d theta wedge dh, I precisely get dh. And so this is precisely the moment map, also because it is invariant. So it is S1 invariant, right? So all the points in this parallel, they have the same height. OK. So the second example, which is exa again a baby example, but it's very important, is C2 with the following uh, symplectic form. So this symplectic, so Z1 and Z2, they are just the complex coordinates on C2. And this form is precisely the form that I showed you before at the beginning of this section. So if I identify C2 with R4, this is precisely the form omega 0 that you saw on the first slide. It's really easy to see. So <clears throat> the T2 action is just, so this lambda 1, lambda 2 are elements of S1 acting on Z1, Z2 by lambda 1, Z1, lambda 2, Z2. So I'm rotating in each complex plane. And it's easy to see that this action is Hamiltonian, and the, the moment map is given precisely by this. Okay, So it's minus mod Z1 squared divided by 2 minus mod Z2 squared divided by 2. Now, um, let me start noticing some important things. So the image via the moment map of C2 is the negative quadrant in R2. And somehow this is very important. I will tell you why in a second. But another example of Hamiltonian T2 space, in this case my manifold is compact, is CP2 with a special symplectic form, which is referred to as the Fubini study form which I will not write down explicitly, but it's a very well-known symplectic form, killer indeed. 
And the action on CP2 is just given by the following. So these are homogeneous coordinates on CP2. And the action is given by this formula. So we will see actually this action even later. So we will think about it a little bit more altogether. And the moment map <coughs> is given by this formula. And what I would like you to notice is that the image of CP2 through the moment map <coughs> is this very nice convex polytope where around each vertex there exists a GL to Z transformation, that modulo translation. So if I first translate this point to the origin, there exists a GL to Z transformation that transforms this corner into this corner. So modulo GL to Z, all the corners of the image of this moment map, they look like this, basically. And this is not by chance. Um, so well, first of all, let's note that the image of the moment map is a convex polytope. And uh, I mean, it wasn't me. I wasn't too clever to pick special examples, because this is always true. And this is a theorem, a remarkable theorem, of Atia and Gilemin and Sternberg, who proved it in 82, which says precisely that if I have a Hamiltonian t-space, so compact, connected, Hamiltonian t-manifold, then the image of the moment map is always a convex polytope. And in fact, it is the convex hull of the images of the fixed points of the t-action. OK? So, so now we go to the question of trying to classify all these spaces. And so, well, one question that maybe doesn't sound the most natural one, but it will become more uh, meaningful in a couple of slides, is can we reconstruct the whole Hamiltonian T space from the image of the moment map? Okay. So in order to answer this question, I have to introduce um, an integer associated to my Hamiltonian t-space, which is called the complexity of my Hamiltonian t-space, which is given by the dimension of the manifold divided by 2 minus the dimension of the torus acting on the manifold, effectively. So now one can prove that, so this first of all is an integer because m is always even dimensional. And one can prove that this is always an integer which is greater or equal than 0. So now. Of course, the name complexity is not, was not chosen like randomly. So it was chosen in such a way that if the complexity is 0, these spaces should be um, easy to study. It's called a symplectic toric manifold. So in this case, I have a torus acting on the manifold, which is precisely half the dimension of the manifold. And that's the biggest torus, the biggest symmetry that I can have. And so the remarkable theorem is that in this case, in fact, the image of the moment map tells me everything about the, mo about the symplectic manifold itself. So the theorem of Delzant says that the symplectic toric manifold, m omega t mu, is completely determined up to symplectomorphisms and t equivalent means that they intertwine the t action by the image of the moment map. And the image of the moment map in this case is called the design polytope, which has the property that I was describing before. So modulo GL and Z transformations and modulo translations, locally it looks like the positive orthant in Rn. And now also, the, so there is also uh, a converse, meaning that every Delzan polytope, so for every Delzan polytope, I can construct a symplectic manifold in such a way that the image of, an, of the moment map is precisely D. And this is quite remarkable because it says that basically the symplectic toric manifolds are, so we can study all the properties that we want uh, about the symplectic toric manifold from the image of the moment map, which is a relatively easy object to study because it's just a special polytope. Okay? But so now this was a very special case because I am taking a manifold, a symplectic manifold, with the highest symmetry possible. So now, what if the complexity is greater or equal than 1? Well, in general, I cannot hope that the image of the moment map characterizes my manifold up to symplectomorphisms because, well, if I take, uh, if I take a manifold M of dimension 2,000 and I put an S1 action on it, the image is just going to be a closed interval. So it would be 
well, it would be very, very surprising if all these manifolds were characterized by this interval. So this is not true in general. So now, um, if the complexity is exactly one, actually, in this conference that I was uh, at last week, Karshan gave a talk about her new work with Sue Tolman, because they are proving that, in fact, uh, they can give a complete list of invariants for these complexity one spaces. But this is unfortunately uh, still a work in progress. So uh, they finished the classification in some special cases, which they call tall complexity one spaces, but I'm not going to enter into the details. But they still have to complete this classification. And they claim that by 2015, we will have a complete classification of these spaces. So let's hope so. Um, and one of these invariants include uh, the, the, the image of the moment map. But so that is not sufficient. Okay. So instead of taking this direction, so instead of trying to study these manifolds with a lower symmetry and try to characterize all of them, what we could do is to try to require something a little bit weaker, meaning, well, maybe I don't want to characterize the whole manifold up to the suitable transformations, but I would like to characterize their topological invariants. Okay? And now I will show you uh, that we can associate, so now I will just assume that I have a small symmetry. I just have an S1 symmetry on my manifold. And um, so I have a Hamiltonian S1 space. And I will show you that to these Hamiltonian S1 spaces, I can always associate basically an object which is a graph. And so from the graph, then it's um, the hope is that one could recover, for example, the equivalent cohomology ring, equivalent chain classes, and so on. So the goal is to introduce a family of multigraphs, because actually to each of these spaces there, there may be many multigraphs associated to, to it. But I would like this multigraph to encode as much information about the S1 action as possible. And for example, what kind of information? Well, I mean, sitting in, in S1, I have many cyclic groups, zk for some k greater than 1. And I would like to study how, so this manifold n, if this denotes a manifold which is fixed by a certain zk, it would be nice to see how these manifolds which are fixed by a smaller subgroup, they lie, they live inside my manifold m. Um, I will give you many examples on this, so you shouldn't be like um, surprised. So for simplicity, I am going to assume that the set of fixed points of the S1 action is discrete. So I have isolated fixed points. OK. So before introducing my multigraph, I should tell you how the action looks like around a fixed point P. So then this is, if you want, this is a proposition that if P is a fixed point of the S1 action, then S1 actually acts on the tangent space at P of M. And why is that? Well, because each transformation is going to fix the point P. So if I consider the differential of that transformation, that is going to go from the tangent space at P to the tangent space at P. And so I have an S1 group of transformation. So I have uh, a homomorphism so I have an S1 which is acting on my tangent space. And so basically, I can say that uh, this tangent space looks like Cn, and the action is given by the following formula, where these w I, W1p, Wnp are called the weights of the S1 action at P. And we will see in a second like how this action really looks like. Um, OK, so now let me define W to be the, so this is a union as a multiset. So these W1P, WNP, they might not be all distinct. So I might have repetitions. So I want to take these as a multiset, meaning that I want to keep track of repetitions. And then I, and then I take the union as a multiset over all the fixed points. Now, it turns out that since we are assuming that our fixed points are isolated, this implies that 0 is not in W. So somehow, um, the, way my, the way my isotropy submanifolds, so the way the submanifolds si uh, fixed by zk are sitting inside my manifold, is related to, to these weights here. And we would like to keep track in the graph uh, about, about 
about, about this information. So <coughs> the theorem about a Tori says that if an element W is in capital W, then also the opposite is. So in other words, if I have, so if P is a fixed point, and these are the weights at the fixed point P, minus 1, 2, 3, then there exists another fixed point, maybe the same fixed point, where one of the, f one of the weights is minus 2. And the other two, I, I don't care. But they always pair. So there will be another point in which the weight is minus 3, and so on. And so the idea for building up this graph is to join these pairings. Okay? And this is precisely the way I'm going to define this multigraph. So the vertex set V is precisely the fixed point set. And I label each vertex by the value of the moment map. And the edge set E is given by, well, there exists an edge E between two vertices P and Q only if one of the weights at P is K and one of the weights at Q is minus K. And I also require that if K is greater than 1, then P and Q must belong to the same connected component of MZK. So this is the submanifold of M fixed by ZK. And somehow this is a technical assumption. It's not, well, it is important, but um, it's not. Uh, we are going to see in the example how, how it works. And now we want to direct the edge from P to Q, namely from the positive weight to the negative weight. And we want to label also each edge by K, where K is the positive, the positive weight appearing in this pairing. So there may, since there may be many ways of pairing these integers together, there may, there may be several multigraphs associated to this manifold. But the important thing is that each of these multigraph will determine the weights at P for every fixed point P. OK? So let's see some examples. So again, let me take CP2. So here I'm not really, I don't really care about the symplectic structure. I care about the action. So now I consider the S1 action, which is given by, so lambda acting on this homogeneous coordinates is given by this formula here. And I want m and n to be co-prime positive integers. So now it's easy to see that if you go to charts, to the three charts, standard charts in CP2, I have exactly these three fixed points. And these are the multi-set of weights. Why is that? Well, let's see. So around P0, I have the chart in which I have to divide by the first coordinate. And so the action just looks like, so if z1 divided by z0 is my new coordinate w1, and z2 over z0 is w2, the action looks like lambda w1, w2 goes to lambda to the m w1, lambda to the m plus n w2. So the weights are just m and m plus n. In the chart in which the second is not, uh, is not vanishing, here I have to divide by lambda to the m z1, and so here I will have lambda to the minus m z0 over z1 and lambda to the n z2 over z1. And so the weights are minus m and n, and the same thing at p2. And so now I have my three fixed points, p0, p1, and p2. And this is basically the labeling, because at p0 I have weights m and m plus n. At p1 I have minus m, because this is an edge entering at p1 and n, and so on. And this is the only pairing unless m and n are equal to 1, in which case I could also pair this at, I could also have two edges pairing p0 with p2 and a cycle here. OK. So now the question is, how much information is encoded in one of the multigraphs associated to this manifold? So does it determine the manifold up to S1 equivariant symplectomorphisms? So in other words, can I hope that this graph actually determines my manifold completely? And the answer is yes or no. It depends on the dimension of the manifold. So it depends. So the, so the answer is it depends. And does it de determine some equivariant topological invariance? Well, also the, the answer to this question is it depends. So now we will see in which cases I can actually determine some topological invariance. Okay. So the four-dimensional case. So in the four-dimensional case, I have a Hamiltonian S1 space, which is, in this case, a complexity one space, because half the dimension of the manifold is 2, minus 1 is 1. So this is a complexity one space, right? 
Now, the remarkable thing is that Carchon, in 97, based on work of uh, Attori, Ahara, and Odin, proved that, in fact, in this case, the Hamiltonian S1 space is completely determined up to suitable transformations by the label multigraph. And she also gave a way of producing all the possible multigraphs that can arise. So basically, for this type of complexity one spaces, all the information is, in fact, encoded in the label multigraph, which is quite remarkable. But in higher dimension, this is not true, unfortunately. Oops. And so let's see. So for example, she says that if you have a multigraph which looks like this, where this is the value of the moment map at the vertices, which is just going to be a real number. Well, this tells you that um, the S1 space associated to this label multigraph is precisely CP2 with the standard with the S1 action that we saw before. And the symplectic form is in such a way that the class in the Durand cohomology represented by omega is a generator of the H2 which in this case has no torsion, so it can be viewed as a sublattice of H2 of MR. So, but let's see what happens in higher dimensions. So what if the dimension of M is greater than four? Well, in general, the family of this multigraph does not determine the space. Um, I cannot hope that it does, although in some very particular cases it might, but in general it does not and it depends on the symplectomorphism groups of some other symplectic manifolds associated to this manifold, but I do not want to talk about that. But, so, in this case, so if I go in this direction, I have to introduce other invariants uh, in addition to the multigraph in order for me to be able to classify the space. But what we actually want to do is to take another direction, because for certain nice spaces, and I will give examples of nice spaces, I can actually compute the equivalent cohomology ring and churn classes of the manifold from this graph, okay? So, and examples of nice spaces are Hamiltonian S1 spaces with minimal number of fixed points, and we will see that in this case, the Betty numbers are the same as the Betty numbers of CPN, where the dimension of M is 2N, and also goreski with mcpherson spaces, so the so-called GKM spaces, which, for example, are given by the symplectic toric manifolds that we saw before and flag varieties. So actually, I will not have time to talk about the second category of spaces, although I prepared some slides about them. But what I would like to say is that doing, um, so trying to get the equivalent cohomology ring from the multigraph associated to this object is very much related to doing equivalent Schubert calculus. So this is a very, very, very nice area of mathematics in which you know you have the combinatorics from Schubert calculus coming together with symplectic geometry, and so in some sense you can use tools from both, you know, from both point of views to try to make up a theory. So this is actually something that I worked on, and it's a very interesting. I really liked working on these spaces because you can actually see, for example, you can see what the killer cone of these varieties look like just from a picture in some sense. So I think this, this is a very nice area that should still be explored. But I will mainly talk about the first, the first category of spaces. So what is the idea for getting from the multigraph the structure of the cohomology ring? So the multiplicative structure of this ring. Because the additive structure is easy. I mean, it's trivial. It should be explained better, but Trust me. The, the, so as a vector space, the cohomology ring is trivial. What is hard to get is the, is the multiplicative structure. So the idea is to use equivariant Morse theory. Why equivariant Morse theory? So we need to have a Morse function. Where does the Morse function come from? Well, it comes from the moment map because it turns out that Frankel proved that the moment map mu for the S1 action is an invariant Morse function. And the critical set of mu coincide with the fixed point set. Not only that, but each, so the, each critical point has an even Morse index, meaning that the, if you take an S1 invariant metric and you consider the unstable manifold flowing away from my critical point, those are going to give you generators in cohomology. Okay? So the idea is basically to use the moment map as a Morse function and, oops, 
and to introduce a basis for this cohomology, which is canonically associated to mu, meaning exactly, I mean, it's, which is precisely what I said. So it's to take this G, this S1 invariant metric, and do Morse theory with this, with this metric. But now, the hard thing is to compute the structure constants with respect to this basis from the information encoded in the multigraph. So this is what is hard to do, and the reason why I need nice spaces to work on. Okay? So let's see. So I will talk now about this S1 Hamiltonian spaces with minimal number of fixed points. So if the dimension of M is 2N, then having a Hamiltonian on my manifold means that the S implies that the S1 fixed points, the number of fixed points, is at least M plus 1. And this follows from the fact that since I have a compact symplectic manifold, powers of the class, the rank class represented by the symplectic form, will give me non-zero elements in the cohomology. So I have to have at least M plus 1 fixed points because each fixed point is related to, to a cohomology class. And so my cohomology doesn't, cannot vanish in any of the even degrees. Okay? So I have to have at least M plus 1. But if we want minimal number, I will assume that this is precisely M plus 1. And so the Betty numbers coincide with the Betty numbers of CPN. Now, in 2009, Tolman proved that a basis for the equivariant cohomology ring of M is given by powers of the first equivariant Chern class. So here I'm putting equivariant in parentheses because I don't want to talk about the technicalities of the equivariant cohomology ring. But whatever I'm, say, I'm, I'm going to say for non-equivariant things also holds for the equivariant cohomology ring. Okay. So the first thing that one should notice is that the first chain class does not vanish for these Hamiltonian spaces. And, and so I should rescale this, the powers of this first chain class by a certain number. And so the difficulty is that this rescaling factor comes from the multigraph. So the rescaling factors are deter determined by one of the label multigraphs associated to this manifold. So let's see. So what do we want to classify? So I say, OK, so let's give a nice class of spaces. For example, these Hamiltonian T spaces with isolated fixed points. So let's first of all try to classify all the possible labeled multigraphs that can arise. Because then what could I do? Then I could say, OK, well, Maybe in some certain nice cases, I can determine all the possible equivalent cohomology rings and churn classes which are associated to these multigraphs, which in the category of minimal number of fixed points has been done by Tolman. In other categories, has been done by myself and Tolman and Gilemin and Zara. So you can really, so, and these actually, these two categories for these two, I would have to mention what GKM spaces are. And so then there is a nice way of going from the equivariant topological invariance to the non-equivariant ones. So I can actually determine the ordinary cohomology ring structure and chain classes from the equivariant ones. Okay? So the first goal is to classify all the possible labels, the multigraphs that can arise. Now I will go back to the situation in which I have minimal number of fixed points. And classification results, so, well, of course, we start from the simplest case, which is just the dimension 4 case, in which case I have exactly three fixed points, because the dimension of m divided by 2 is 2, plus 1 is 3, so I have three fixed points. And basically, from the classification of Karshon that I mentioned before, the only multigraph that can arise is the following. So where this edge is labeled by m, this is labeled by n, and this is labeled by the sum. And from this multigraph, I can get the cohomology, which is precisely the cohomology of CP2, and the total churn class. Now, if in addition to this multigraph, I add the labeling of the moment map, this will also tell me that this graph determines completely the manifold, which is going to be S1 equivalently symplectomorphic to CP2. So in dimension 4, the problem is easy. Now, in dimension 6, it's not so easy. Because there has been work by Ahara in 91, who actually um, classified just all the possible multigraphs associated to, in fact, she also she, he assumes that this manifold is uh, an almost complex manifold, that the S1 action is just preserving my almost complex structure. And she, 
uh, he assumes that the other characteristic is four, which is true in the case in which, in the category in which she works. So in these cases, she works with Hamiltonian S1 spaces with the same Betty numbers as CP3, and she classifies all the labeled graphs and the cohomology ring. And these are the only four possibilities that can arise. So I can only have this multigraph and which with associated cohomology ring, which is just the cohomology ring of CP3, and total chart class, which is the total chart class of CP3. And in this case, one can say that if I have an S1 Hamiltonian manifold with four fixed points, um, then in the case in which the multigraph looks like this, the manifold is diffeomorphic to CP3. But I cannot say much more. Then I have a second arrangement of weights, which naturally arises in a, in, an action, in a natural action that can be defined on the Grassmannian of oriented planes in R5. And this, in fact, is the cohomology ring and total churn class of this manifold here. And when Tolman classified these manifolds, she also had these two mysterious graphs that she didn't know where they came from. But actually, Dusa McDuff, who is with us in the audience, constructed uh, constructed these two manifolds symplectically, and they turn out to be manifolds which are known to, to algebraic geometers because they are Tufano manifolds called V5 and V22. And the 5 and 22 are related to this constants in the cohomology ring. And so at a certain point, I was visiting Sue because we were working on this other project, and she asked me, well, why don't you try to extend these results to dimension 8? But she said, I have already tried to do that, but I didn't succeed, so I was a little worried, right? I was, well, if she didn't succeed, let's see how far I can go. And so actually she thought about this problem already with Godinho, who's at the Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon. And I started to work with Godinho to see what they had already done. And actually the methods that Tolman used in the six-dimensional case, they all applied to the eight-dimensional case. But the number of cases to investigate was like 12,000 12, cases to investigate. At a certain point, I convinced myself that I could go up to 200. But then I, then I realized that each case had like several, several subcases. So the number of cases depending on the definition of case, right? So if in order to solve a case, it takes a month, then maybe it's not really one case. But it's, I mean, it, I spent some time, let's say. So I, I figured that this was not the, the best way to go. And together with Godinho, we actually found another way out, which surprisingly applies to any dimension and actually any number of fixed points. So we derive a simple algebraic identity that involves the first chain class of the manifold. And this actually enables us to construct an algorithm. So we use the computer to obtain a linear relation among the isotropy weights. Linear relation, just, just like the ones that you see here. So this is the weight A, B, C, and this is the sum of A and B, and so on. And so this algorithm works in any dimension and any number of fixed points. And now I will show you how the algorithm works. I will give you, like, really, I will run the program in front of you. Hopefully, it will work. And, and this is contained in our preprint, which is called New Tools for Classifying Hamiltonian Circle Collections with Isolated Fixed Points. Let me give you an idea of how the algorithm works. So instead of trying to determine the weights, there is another integer which is more convenient to determine, which we call the magnitude of an edge, which is just the sum of the, so for each edge E, which goes from P to Q, we define ME to be the sum of the weights at P minus the sum of the weights at Q divided by K, which is the positive weight associated to the edge. And for those of you who know a little bit about equivariant cohomology theory, this is nothing else but the equivariant first chain class at P minus the equivariant first chain class at Q divided by K. And this is an integer. So now, here it comes the geometry. For certain nice actions, there exists a multigraph gamma associated to my Hamiltonian space, which is called positive, in such a way that all these magnitudes are positive. And this is an important condition just because we proved that, in fact, for every multigraph gamma associated to the Hamiltonian S1 space, m omega S1 mu, with minimal number of fixed points, the sum of this magnitude is constant and is given by this number. So the trick is, instead of determining the weights, 
try to determine a partition of this number into the number of edges E in such a way that it will satisfy some extra properties. And so in order for, for this partition to be, you know, in order to have finitely many partitions, I need to know, for example, that all these MEs are positive. And this formula comes from the fact that we prove that this is, in fact, the integral over the manifold of the C1, Cn minus 1, which is pretty, pretty nice. I mean, you know, the day uh, we discovered this formula was like one of those days in which you go home and you're happy to do research. We sh you should also average this day with the previous four months in which you were just, you know, stuck every day. But this, this was definitely a nice day. So I don't remember exactly when this happened, but I remember that being a very happy day in any case. Um, okay, so then we prove that if the action extends to a T2 action, or if none of the weights is one, then there exists a positive multigraph associated to this, and so we can, we can really look for those partitions. And what we prove is that indeed, in this case, the only multigraph that can arise is precisely the complete graph on five vertices, where the labeling are given by, so this is A, B, C, D, and every time I have a triangle, the, longer, the longest edge is labeled with the sum of the two, of the two, uh, of the labeling of the, of the smaller edges. So for example, this is labeled by A plus B, this is labeled by B plus C, and so on. Is this the, these results apply to all graphs or just the minimum one? The minimum one. And so the sum, the sum. Ah, yes, the sum. The the yes, but we also have a formula for the non-minimal one. Right. I can, I can show it. To you, yeah, yeah. Right. That it will depend on the Betty numbers of the manifold. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, and so in this case, since I told you that I can I can actually um, produce the equivariant and non-equivariant cohomology ring and churn classes from the graph, we get that the cohomology ring and total churn class is precisely the same as CP4. But we cannot conclude that actually, if there is a manifold with this multigraph associated, then I actually have something which is either diffeomorphic or even more nicely symplectomorphic to CP4. So we cannot conclude that. But so let me just finish. No, let me, let me first show you how the, the program works. And now this is the moment in which I, I hope that everything will work fine. Okay, can you see? Yeah. So evaluation, evaluate notebook. Insert the dimension of the manifold. Let's do the six dimensional case. Number of fixed points is minimal, so it's four. The value of the integral in this case is 24. And now I need to put just the coordinates of the vertices of the graph. So I'm going to put 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 0, 3. And now let's cross our fingers. OK, so these are all the possible multigraphs that can arise. But then the program runs, does some computation based on the theorem that I showed you before. And it gives me the solutions. So. This graph here, the only weights that can occur are these four family of weights. And so this means that I have, so here I have a two-dimensional lattice of weights. And you can actually, so you see, this algorithm is giving me linear relations among the weights. And what you can do afterwards is to take, for example, this first lattice independently and trying to work out and see if inside this two-dimensional lattice, there is a one-dimensional lattice, which has given me the, all the possible weights for a certain S1 action. So basically, this algorithm reduces the number of possible cases drastically. Because a priori, you would start with one, two, three, four, five, six positive integers to look for. And you see here, you just have a two parameter families of these integers. Okay. So this other case, so the first, in this case, this first list of weights is precisely one of those Fano manifolds that I showed you before. 
which is associated to this graph. And in the second case, I would have to look for, so is it, it is not true that for any B1 and B2, I would have a set of weights for an S1 action on, with this graph. So I will have to look for a certain sublattice insi inside this, inside the, inside this, this two-dimensional lattice here. And, it, and there is one, and it would be associated to the second man of ma fan of manifold that I showed you before. But the nice thing is that for the complete graph, I have a clean solution, meaning that for every B1 and B2, these are precisely the weights of the Grassmannian that I showed you before, and these are precisely the weights for CP3 that I showed you before. So in this case, I would have no work to do, basically. And let me just show you how the eight-dimensional case works. I am not going to run the algorithm because in this case, unfortunately, it would take uh, an hour or so, maybe a little bit more. So in this case, as I said before, unfortunately, I have many, many, many more cases to investigate. And in fact, look at how many multigraphs I have to investigate, which by hands, it requires some work. But then the algorithm works for us, and we only have one solution, which is at the very end, and is this one. So the only arrangement of weights is the one for which we have a complete graph, and these are precisely the weights um, that I showed you before on one of the last pictures. So I will conclude my talk by giving you a list of questions that I would like to answer. Oh, did I? Oh, sorry. And so now the questions are the following. So first of all, can we classify all the possible multigraphs and hence the cohomology rings and churn classes that can arise in higher dimensions? Well, the answer to this question is yes, with some dots, because the number, because still this algorithm is actually not, let's say, perfect from a complexity point of view. Okay, so there are megabytes and megabytes of cases of files that are produced from, from this algorithm. And so the answer is yes, but we need collaborators. So if you're interested in this problem, you should let me know because I would be very happy to give you a multigraph, which will become your friend for a little while. And you can work on it and run the program and help us to classify in this spaces in dimension 10, for example. Now, so we pretty much know how to solve this, this problem, modulo this, uh, you know, modulo having a powerful computer. But the harder problem is, given a multigraph gamma, does there exist a Hamiltonian S1 space such that one of the associated multigraphs is gamma? So this is much, much harder question. And we are actually also working on this question because we are hunting for an S1 manifold with very specific properties. And we hope to find you know, the candidate. And we hope that this candidate satisfies many, many properties of consistency. And then we could say, OK, now we can really construct this manifold. And I think I am pretty much done. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they, they are always directed. They are all directed up. I, I didn't do it because I ran out of time preparing the pictures, to be super, super honest, but they are all directed to be up. And yeah. What is the significance of the direction? That goes up. Yeah, it, it is actually important because um, every time I know that, uh, so every time a, an edge is going up, it means two things. So it means that uh, maybe I can use. So this is actually, so if I know, for example, that I have a graph like this, I know that if I take the magnitude, so, so this will be, OK. So each fixed point will have a certain number of 
edges which are entering into it, right? So this has zero edges entering into it. This has one, sorry. So this has zero, this has one, two, and three. So now the thing is that um, the magnitude of the directed edge E is positive precisely when the number of negative weights, so the number of negative weights at P is strictly less than the number of negative weights, weights at Q. So in other words, I know that for this graph, I will have all positive magnitudes. So that is the importance of. So the graph actually tells me whether the algorithm that I'm running is finite or not. I can be more precise on that, but uh, this is basically what happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I don't know. That's a very good question. I don't know the answer, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I. This is something that should be worth thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So at this point here, I know that the index of the Morse function is two. Why is that? Well, because I have I have basically a. Uh, okay. So there there was at a certain point a local normal form, if you want, that tells me what is the action around this point. And it's precisely given by the following. So suppose that the weight associated with this edge is 1, this is 2, and 3. So this is, say, this is saying that the weight at this point, the weights at this point are minus 1, 2, and 3. And so I know that locally the action looks like this. And I know that locally my moment map has also a very very specific form, and it is given by this. And so I know that the Morse index is precisely 2, because I have two real directions on which the Hessian is negative definite. So there is a relation between the local normal form and the moment map around that point, and once I know the moment map, I know the index. And so this is always true, so I can always. Uh, 